Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone in from the waiting room. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arletha Lizana. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine, also director of the Innovations Learning Laboratory for Population Health, and the Community Health Worker Strategic Advisor for the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. I'm joined by Program Manager Amina Isom today and three panelists. Um, so the topic that we will talk about today is leading change on the front line. So examining the impact of community health workers in primary care and during public health crises. So today our moder moderated discussion will focus on the work of community health workers in community and the value and impact that community, community health workers have had in preventing chronic diseases and managing individual and community health. So our panelists today will talk about um, their experiences with community health worker programs, uh, related programs, and we'll kind of hear directly about their role um, and how it's evolved during the COVID-19 pandemic. So our agenda for today is I'll just do a couple of slides of the CHW mobilization strategy. Uh, so you'll hear us interchangeably say community health worker, but we also use the term community health liaison. Uh, Amina will give an overview of some of the components of the program, as well as talk to our panelists about their involvement, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. So just briefly, the Innovation and Learning Laboratory is a state-of-the-art community-centered learning laboratory um, designed to implement community health improvement projects. Those projects have a community engagement program, some type of health uh, issue or challenge uh, that we're working on as well as technology. And so we are a demonstration uh, unit. Um, so we do demonstration projects really to figure out the best way to approach uh, uh, better health in communities. Um, and so we also have a revenue generating arm where we develop products um, for use uh, by community and individuals. So uh, just a quick background in terms of community health worker training, Morehouse School of Medicine has trained community health workers for over 20 years. Uh, we have trained over 400 community health workers to work in a variety of settings, including primary care, um, you know, academia, community, et cetera, on a, a, a round of various issues. Um, in terms of chronic diseases, uh, mental health, and so forth. So, um, you know, the Innovation Lab began in 2015, and we began with a patient-centered medical home and neighborhood in which we trained community health workers uh, to do patient visits um, in um, medically underserved communities. 
But one of our most innovative programs is the high school and young adult community health workers training program uh, that started in 2016. And to date, we've trained approximately 130 high school and young adult students and additional 250 have been trained utilizing our digital training curriculum. So the innovation lab conducts both youth uh, and young adult as well as adult training and does capacity building for organizations. So today we will discuss the development of the INSERN community health worker rapid training and deployment mobilization model. So this, we are in year two of um, a, a Office of Minority Health Grant uh, with INSERN, the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. And as I mentioned, I am the CHW lead and uh, Mina Isom is the program manager. Uh, so our mobilization strategy for year two is really about our community health liaisons. They're centered. Uh, they are at the forefront of reaching out to about 12,000 people and organizations across the United States. Um, we are also building capacity for community-based organizations to develop COVID-19 community health worker mobilization plans. Uh, we developed a new program this year, which Amina will talk about, the Young Adult Community Mental Health Workers Training Program. And, you know, really our goal this year is really to increase visibility of intern community health workers. Um, so we have a lot of lessons learned, and I'll talk about those at the end. So I'll pass it over to Amina Isom now, you know, who will lead our panel discussion. Amina. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. So the first um, program I'll be talking about will be the Intern Community Health Workers or Community Health Engagement Liaisons. Um, there, the two are interchangeable. It just depends on what um, our audience likes as a cohort. And so this um, program relates to dissemination of information in, in their respective communities. We have um, liaisons across the nation in Georgia, Texas, oh, uh, Detroit, as well as Louisiana and others as well. As you can see, we can um, have six, we're hoping for 12, um, but um, our goals are to increase our presence across the nation. And so some of the activities the CHLs um, participate in are, we have monthly meetings. We have meetings on the second and fourth um, Wednesdays. We go over dashboards as well as um, encounters, as well as um, outreach information. To the right of the slide, you can see an example of an individual dashboard as well as an aggregate dashboard. The individual dashboard um, is an, uh, shows data shows a graphic visualization of um, the encounters that the CHLs um, do in their field. So as you can see, they have new encounters for his follow-up, they have encounters by month, and then they can also see um, if it was in-person versus virtual, as well as individual, family, or organization. The aggregate dashboard as a whole um, is uh, data collected as the whole cohort. So as you can see, the months, um, tiny, but um, from July to April, you can see the difference um, of encounters that the CHLs participate in, as well as new encounter versus follow-up. Other um, types of documentations that include invoices, they, they submit invoices to where they could get paid um, that matches their um, encounters um, as well. <laughs> Sorry, next slide. So um, this is the insert community health liaison data for the month of April. Um, the encounter outcomes relate to um, COVID as well as shared CHAMP survey, shared call center cards as well as re relates to INSERN as well as the INSERN app um, and referrals to COVID testing. Social support includes transportation support, and food support, um, as you can see, are the majority of the topics uh, these CHLs encounter when they're in the field and approaching these approaching their individuals. Next slide. So as you can see, this is a map of where our CHLs um, are deployed in as far as their communities. As you can see, Texas, um, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Arizona, and New Mexico, the southern region of the nation um, are, is where a majority of our CHLs um, deploy in their communities. Next slide. 
So uh, we have a Sage L here who will talk about what she does and her experience as she is in her respective community. And she, I would just like to ask Laquita, just come off camera and to introduce yourself. And I'm going to ask her a couple of questions to where you can guys get a firsthand um, perspective of what CHLs do. Hi, Laquita. Hello. Go ahead and introduce yourself. And I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Lizana and Amina for having me. And thank you guys so much to the other panelists that are, are here today. My name is Laquita Benton and I am a community health liaison with NCERN, National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. I've been in the community health work field for about nine years. I started in 2013 as a, um, as a patient coordinator with, um, with, um, Oh my God, I can't remember the day. I was at I was stationed at Southside Medical Center and I was working on the United Way Project um, Access Health. Um, and after which um, my term ended on and there, I was hired uh, permanently as a community health worker at Southside. And I was there for five years um, until 2020 uh, when COVID hit. Um, I would say that I have been coordinating and providing resources way before I was a community health worker. And so that's how I know that community health workers are not made, we are born. And it has been my, um, my privilege to be a part of the community health liaison that we have here at Morehouse School of Medicine under the NSERM project. Thank you. Um, so could you expand more about uh, what your role is with Insert and what do you do as far as your own personal touch on your encounters and how you um, just be as a community health liaison? How, what, what is your style? What's the best way um, to encounter individuals? And then just kind of briefly speak on um, why did you want to participate being a CHO with Insert? Okay, so as a community health liaison, I'm responsible for disseminating true, accurate, updated information regarding COVID-19 to um, the most vulnerable communities um, that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, the, one of the ways that we do that is I have a, a partner, my partner is Felicia Lovick. Um, we are both responsible for Georgia. And what we do is we um, first reach out to small business and CBOs, the community-based organizations in our communities, um, and we find ways to partner with them through outreach. So we've been, we've been all over Georgia, um, especially last year, um, going from different counties and providing PPE supplies and PPE kits. And we were fortunate enough to um, get a donation of over 350 boxes of, of wipes from Good Wipes. Um, we also partnered with the Atlanta Community 2 Bank. They provided us with masks and um, hand sanitizer and gloves. And so when we go out to partner with these um, community-based organizations, we don't want to just gather information and data to take back to Morehouse, but we want to make sure that we are providing resources to them as well. So that was um, high on our list to make sure that we get the donations and what we needed to make sure that we um, provide it to our community. Um, and so what we do is um, we, go, we go out and we provide, we actually, we, we buy the little treat bags and we, I wish I had a picture or I could show you one right now, but I don't have one in front of me, but we put these um, PPE supplies and little treat bags along with updated COVID-19 information that is provided to us from Morehouse School of Medicine. And we go out and once we communicate with the individuals that are at these particular food entries, um, and any other community um, events that they may be having, uh, we provide those kits to them as a means of just being vigilant in the community and just want to make sure that we have something that to give them as they're giving us information on how they've been impacted by COVID. That's, that's great and that's awesome. Um information. So thank you, Laquita. I will say once, I will ask one last question. Um, what have you learned while doing outreach? Well, while we've been doing outreach, I've really learned how COVID has affected the refugee community. One of the first things that our first organizations that we partnered with were, um, was, um, 
Well Refugee Center over in Clarkston. And if you're aware of Clarkston area, there's a high um, community of refugees over there. And what we experienced is their, their, the enormous amount of food insecurity there. And so because of that, we partnered with um, Metro Atlanta Urban Farm over in College Park, and they um, gave us some, some food supplies to give to um, the World Refugee Center to those individuals that they, that they help on a, on a daily basis. And so for, I wanna say six months from the time we started, um, with insert until about June of last year, we were able to get food boxes to those clients at World Refugee Center. That's amazing. You're doing amazing work, Laquita. Thank you so much for speaking today and thank you for the work that you're doing. And it's just great to see your passion and to hear your passion um, over, over, over the line. So thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. I have to go, but thank you guys so much for having me and allowing me to be a part of the panel. You have a great Enjoy day. Our- thank you. All right. So now we're going to move over to our Insurance Community Bridges program, our CBO CHW Capacity Building. So this program or initiative um, focuses on training technical assistance and capacity building amongst community-based organizations to where they can um, implement their own CHW mobilization strategy. And so we partner with organizations who they apply with or are interested in um, at least attempting to develop and to disseminate their, um, their capacity building. and and CHW strategy mobilization. So they do have uh, financial support to where they can um, add add resources or just to support their their goal and their initiative. And so we have a representative on the the call today um, who will speak later on, but I wanted to touch on um, some of the aspects um, that the CBO program um, houses. And so we have monthly webinars. Um, you can see that there are different topics that relate um, to CHW or community engagement, um, as well as health communications. And um, you can see there's different regions of different um, CBOs we've had in the past, um, and then also awardees, um, re- awardees uh, that they receive as well. Um, Next slide, please. And so here today we have uh, Mr. George Fishburne with Omega Sci-Fi who will introduce himself and the work that his organization does in the community. Welcome George and please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Amina. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Livingston uh, and panelists, thank you so much. We're glad to be here. Uh, Well, I'm George Fishburne. I'm actually the Senior Program and Project Manager at International Headquarters for the Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity. Uh, We have been around for quite a while, uh, going back to 1911, November 17, to be precise. And uh, for many years, uh, in uh, uh, in recent years, my work actually uh, in this particular area predated my involvement in the fraternity. Uh, For 20 years, I was a drug and alcohol counselor with Miami-Dade County uh, in the drug court division. And much of that work, the nexus for that work was uh, connecting to community uh, resources and, and, and persons who were in the community who had substance abuse uh, challenges. And our goal was to get them out of the community, get them into treatment, outpatient day treatment or residential treatment and to, uh, and to meet them at the point of their needs. Additionally, uh, for my church in Miami, Florida, which is where I'm from, uh, the New Birth Baptist Church, a church of over uh, 18,000 members, I led the Ministry of Social Concerns. And so we we dealt with everything from substance abuse to housing. And so the community-based kind of work that I've done uh, has been both uh, in the public sector, in the private sector, and now in the fraternal nonprofit sector uh, as program and project manager at Omega Sci-Fi. And so in that role, uh, every single program and project uh, that uh, Omega Sci-Fi has its hands in it is my responsibility to provide some leadership and guidance, of course, under the, the, the auspices of our executive director, John Howard, and uh, the man that actually has been involved with this project and introduced it to Omega, our first vice grand boss, Ricky Lewis. So uh, glad to be here. Thank you so much, George. So I will ask 
Um, why did you want to participate in the intern CBO program? Well, I mean, I think from an organizational perspective and from a, uh, from a, uh, uh, from a perspective of yielding results. This is the work that Omega Sci-Fi always al is already doing, but with anything that you're doing, having additional resources and being connected to entities that are not only doing the work, but that are coming up with new innovations that uh, allow you to do the work with much more efficiency is always a credit. And so uh, when we learned of this opportunity and connected with it, it just made sense to, uh, uh, to uh, connect and to uh, get more resources, get guidance, and to develop relationships. So um, that's the primary reason. Thank you for that. Um, I'm looking forward to reviewing you guys' mobilization strategy. Um, and so um, you guys are doing great work. And to follow up with that question, um, what are your thoughts on system level changes and resources that could assist in expanding the impact of CHWs? I think one of the most significant system level changes may sound really uh, uh, elementary and sophomoric, so don't kick me off the feed, but I think at its core, access. Uh, one, of, one of the things I think that we find in the work that we do in Omega is uh, with, with the work specific to this particular opportunity, we'll be in California and Georgia. Uh, and what we're finding is that people just don't have access, but specifically access to communication. They're not getting the information about all of these amazing resources uh, and all of these amazing opportunities that could help uh, meet them at the point of their need. And so um, I would say uh, access is, is really, really significant. One example of this, um, I was just on a call yesterday with the Office of Juvenile Justice and they have um, million dollar grants that they're giving out for purposes of mentoring. And uh, I was one of six attendees on a nationwide call um, for uh, a million dollar mentoring grant uh, for Omega Sci-Fi. And so that is telling uh, when, when, uh, when, uh, when it was apparent that no one else was on that call. And not that anyone, uh, other entities uh, fraternally and otherwise don't have any interest. Uh, it, it's sometimes as simple as uh, not getting access to information. That's that's awesome. Yes. Um, thank you for oh, Dr. Livingston. You were on mute. Oh, no, I wasn't saying anything. I was I was saying, yes, that's it. That's great. That's true. I was, just, I was talking back to the TV screen. <laughs> Thank you, George, so much for your time. And thank you so much for the work that your organization does um, in the community and to just keep going with your efforts. And I'm excited that you've joined um, the Insert CBO program and can't wait to um, for you guys to um, deploy you guys CHW uh, mobilization plan. So thank you. All right, so last, project I will be talking about will be the Intern Young Adult Mental Health Community Health Workers Program. Now this one I'm very excited about because this is our first cohort and the students in this program, um, their projects are amazing. And so this project focuses on, um, it's kind of a, a remix to the uh, high school young adult CHW program, but it focuses on mental health. And why this is important is because of, um, the pandemic as well as you know the times that we in that we're in as well and this picture right here on this slide um, refers to the uh, u.s surgeon general actually um, making a public health crisis um, about mental health for for youth and young adults and so this program um, focuses on virtual training um, they have a um, online curriculum that's 20 modules related to mental health. They go through, it's, it's self-paced, and then um, they have quizzes and before and after each module. Um, in this first cohort, we have 19 young adults. Um, as, as well um, with the program, they receive a $1,000 tra uh, training stipend, $500. Um, upon completion of the training modules and then 500 at the end of their program. They receive equipment um, backpack that comes with first aid kit, um, body measuring tape, infrared thermometer, and other sorts of health monitoring items. Um, deliverables, they do have to complete training as well as monitor um, their community and family members um, as it relates to mental health. They also will um, disseminate and 
um, deploy their community projects with their respective audiences and demographics. Um, they do, uh, the timeline is applications um, open October. Um, the announcement will, uh, they will close around the, um, December 31st and the programs will start um, at the beginning of the year. It's a six month program and we meet um, once a month um, because of the uh, demographic of, of the cohort. They're young adults, they're in, majority of them are grad students. And so we just want them to not be distracted from their education, but to also be engaged with this program and have access to, um, to, to this health initiative and community engagement initiative. And so um, the, the ages span from 20 to 25 years old. Um, you can see their um, um, Exeter, Rhode Island, all across um, the nation. I'm glad that the virtual first cohort of this program has reached, you know, far places across the nation. I'm excited that we have a diverse cohort. Um, and then also students are from Morehouse College, Kennesaw, Meharry Medical College, as well as Emory University. Um, the, their community projects, I'm actually blown away. They're so creative. They're, I'm, I'm very excited. And once they're done and completed, I cannot wait to share um, with the network as well as um, other external partners. But they relate. Uh, some of the projects here um, are digital booklets, sexual health, mental health, and queer health. They have a PTSD toolkit for Black young adults. Um, there's STD and mental health. There's a TikTok mental health campaign, as well as a mental health physical first aid kit um, toolkit um, as well. Um, but we have one of the students online who will briefly talk about her experience um, with the program, as well as her community project and just um, other, uh, other um, items that Ms. Yasmin um, will speak on as it relates to mental health and in her passion um, with mental health and why she chose to participate. So hi, Yasmin, thank you for joining. Please introduce yourself and I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yasmin. Thank you for being here, thank you for listening. Um, so I am part of the Emory Rollins School of Public Health um, master's program. I just wrapped up my first year. Um, Love the program, love the NCRN program as well. And yeah, I'm in the behavioral social health education uh, part of the program. So this aligned very well with like my own interests, both educational and personal. So yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. So um, what have you learned while participating in the Young Adult Mental Health Program? Right, so as you mentioned earlier, we had lots of modules to complete, all um, very important, uh, trained us in mental health literacy, community interventions, basic health, um, even vitals like blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and other ways to improve our communities. So I'd say in such a short amount of time, we learned so much about not only mental health, but also physical health and how the, both of them kind of play the same role in our body. Thank you, yes. Um, so do you wanna just kind of briefly tell us um, about your community project and why you chose that project as well as different components that you have included in your project? Yeah, so my community project is uh, currently creating a behavioral health toolkit and it outlines common illnesses, treatments and contact links for any sort of mental health crisis and um, I've disseminated it through the Emory community, through my role in the Emory Mental Health Alliance. And it was really important for me to create this toolkit since I noticed that many communities, especially marginalized communities, don't have access to a lot of the information and the resources that are in the toolkit. So I kind of wanted them all in a concise, easy to read and easier to share format so that it increases awareness and education on the topic of mental health. And um, a really important component is at the end of the toolkit that I created, there's uh, several links and phone numbers of hotlines to call. And sometimes for a lot of people, it's not about reading the information. It's okay, where do I get help? And so I have a whole um, section of that dedicated to um, contacts and resources that can put people in the right direction, in the right hands to receive care. 
Thank you so much, Yasmin. Yes, I've seen the draft of her toolkit and it's it's visually pleasing and, and I cannot wait for her to share, keep sharing and for, for if with her permission to share with, with you all once she's done. Um, so thank you for that, um, Yasmin. And that concludes the panel speakers. Um, you guys told, um, us about your projects. You guys told us about what you guys do um, in your own organizations, and you and you told us about what you guys do in the field as community liaisons. And we appreciate you guys um, with the community health and engagement piece. And um, I'm giving, going to shoot it back to you, Dr. Livingston. Okay. Thanks so much, Amina. Uh, so yes, and thank you for our panelists today. So we're so excited to kind of just give you a chance to share you know, your interaction with the INCERN project and the team and some of the things that you're working on and how that relates to, you know, things that you're doing, you know, outside of this project. So I think that, you know, in year two um, of the INCERN community health worker mobilizations, there are some lessons learned. So we have a few of them, um, but I'll just talk about a couple today. Um, and so with the coming of the pandemic, you know, one thing that was vitally important is to be able to rapidly train and deploy uh, community health workers. Um, so I'm sure that you have seen um, some of the increase um, in the uh, utilization of community health workers in uh, COVID-19 mitigation. And that, the reason for that is because as we know, community health workers are very close uh, you know, to community residents, that's what they do. You know, they develop relationships and so are trusted members um, of community. And so, you know, the best way to really get information to people that they can trust would be through uh, community health workers. And so, you know, as a part of this though, we wanted to make sure that we were able to rapidly deploy, rapidly train and rapidly deploy community health workers. Um, oftentimes community health worker training itself is, you know, rather lengthy. So for example, um, our community health worker online training is 20 modules, you know, so, you know, it takes about a week really, or, you know, if you're doing it, you know, full time and longer, if not um, to complete. So we were trying to figure out a way to rapidly deploy community health workers. Um, and so for year one, uh, what we did was we partnered with uh, NATWA, the National Organization of Community Health Workers, the National Association, excuse me, of Community Health Workers, um, to help us uh, recruit community health workers that were already trained. Um, so we started there, you know, with those who had experience uh, in the field, and then we just developed a intern training module, you know, to kind of help them understand what the project looked like and some of the deliverables they would have and the thing, the communities uh, that they would be talking to and the type of information they would disseminate and, and other things that are a part of the uh, intern project. Um, but for the second year, um, we did that as well as we opened it up to those who may not have training who are interested in becoming community health workers. Um, so we have a few who have gone actually through the community health worker training, all the while staying to, um, you know, uh, joining those um, bi-monthly or bi-weekly, uh, two times a month, um, calls really to kind of still stay abreast of what's going on in certain, while they were doing their training. Um, and so this idea of being able to, you know, rapidly train and deploy community health workers in, uh, you know, for the COVID-19 pandemic, but also just in terms of emergency preparedness to be able to do that in the future has become an important part of what we do uh, here in the intern project. Um, the second thing that we've learned, um, among others, again, the second thing I want to talk about today would be the need for community health workers to have data to inform their outreach. So as we spoke about briefly, we have developed um, community health worker dashboards. Um, so the community health liaisons get both an individual dashboard for themselves uh, monthly, as well as an aggregate dashboard with all uh, the community health liaison data uh, included. And so what that helps them see is the, you know, where they've been able to do outreach, uh, some areas where they may consider, um, you know, doing outreach, what type of information is most requested so they can have that information on hand, you know, what types of community supports are suggested so they can do research um, before they're doing their outreach to kind of determine, you know, what types of information um, that they should be sharing um, with which communities. And so what we learned is that, you know, we really need to have something that is community health worker facing, meaning it's something for 
specifically designed for them, um, something that they can, you know, find information rapidly and be able to make decisions about where to do uh, um, outreach. And so some of our next steps, uh, we'll be augmenting the intern website to include a community health worker dashboard interface. Um, and so not only are um, community health workers uh, who are associated with the intern project, but others, you know, across the nation will be able to utilize this portal. Uh, we'll be conducting focus group with uh, community health workers and outreach workers um, uh, to really determine what this dashboard uh, should look like, um, as well as you know what are some of the lessons that they've learned, um, kind of working through the COVID-19 pandemic, and then prepare for our year three of our intern CHW mobilization. Um, so what we'll do now is uh, we, I will stop sharing um, and we will take some questions. I can start with the questions that are in the chat box um, and then we can, are we able to also unmute uh, to take questions? But just the first one is, um, so to, to whom is this 20 module training available? So our training, um, we can put the link um, to uh, the innovation lab um, in the chat box, but the innovation learning laboratory, we have several different types of training. Um, so one of those, uh, we have a youth and young adult uh, training um, that's high school and young adult community health worker training. We also have several cultural adaptations. So we have a Haitian American uh, adaptation um, to our high school and young adult program. We also have a Native American and Alaskan Native uh, adaptation that we're actually working on um, as a part of the INSERN project and funding from the Doris Duke Foundation. Um, and so, and then we have another one, oops, we have another one that is a um, opioid um, focused, uh, opioid reduction focused community health worker training program. Um, and then we have an adult community health worker training curriculum. So that is the 20 modules. It is open and available to all. Um, and so that is the, oh, we both put the website in so you can look at the different types of training that we have. So other questions? Wait a second, if anybody has any questions, anything else they would like to add? Uh, so we have other, um, you know, intern staff members and MSM staff members on the line. So if there's anything else you guys think I should elaborate on, I can do that at this time or answer questions. Okay, no questions. Sure, you're positive. Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, well, we will let you go. So what is that, uh, nine minutes? <laughs> Give you back. If there are no questions, well, I'll hang around um, in case there are some questions that pop up. But you know, otherwise, thank you so much um, for coming to our panel presentation today. Thanks, everyone. I was just going to hang out for a couple of minutes, though. Okay, well, I think we can hang up now, Amina. So thank you uh, very much. So if they have any questions, then they can reach out to us. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.